How's everybody doing? Okay. Raise your hand. Where's Miles? Miles not here yet, is he? Raise your hand if you were in Miles' room last night. Really, everybody that was in Miles' room, raise your hand. One more time. Okay. I'm very proud of you all for getting here. Good time? I heard somebody made pizza. Well done, Jody. <laughs> um, welcome back to day two of Videonomics. It was a great video, Josh. Thanks very much. That was some good laid-back music. Um, okay, so we had, uh, we had a couple people that couldn't make, or one person actually that couldn't make it today. They're not feeling well. Um, so we have taken that opportunity to rejigger the, uh, the agenda for today. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. But before we do, uh, I thought we'd go over a couple of thoughts from, you know, big themes that I thought I heard in our conversations yesterday from some of the presentations and some of the chats and the sessions that we did, uh, the breakout sessions. So first big theme, holistic video approach. Uh, feels like the industry has reached a bit of an inflection point and you know, there's enough new channels that have grown in scale that are available to complement the television approach that uh, it's something that needs to be really taken seriously and we as an industry need to find ways to embrace that. One of those ways might be to enable a cross-platform currency. So we're going to talk about that today. Um, and actually, we're going to start with Adam in a little bit on that. Uh, big data, tremendous opportunity, really effing complex. Um, I think everybody in this room sees that, you know, sees big data as a big opportunity and that, um, that we can drive clients' business with big data, but, you know, as one of our uh, client attendees pointed out yesterday, we're all talking gibberish about it, right? We're just talking to ourselves. So we need to find a way to simplify that message. We've got to find a way to explain to clients how all this data and automation and programmatic and, you know, lots of other words that are very, very long are going to drive their business. We, we need to be able to talk to them in English. And um, that, that's something we're going to talk about today. Uh, big theme number three, content. There's a lot more of it. More media partners are producing quality content. As you saw from, uh, from Andrew's presentation yesterday, you're going to see a little bit from Jesse when he gets up to shill for Hulu. Um, Clients are clients want good, you know. Clients want more good content, more uh, premium content, um, and but besides placing your advertising next to content, you know, content and de content development and partnering up with media partners or producing your own content seems to be a little willy nilly. Not everybody's got you know a plan for it, so um, it feels like uh, you know clients need a content strategy, and whose job is that? Is that the client's job? Is that the agency's job? Is that the branded entertainment agency's job? So uh, Paul's going to start a little bit of discussion about that later today. Um, so those are the big themes. I would like to ask the audience, anybody in the audience want to volunteer another big theme from yesterday? Nobody. Come on, one theme? Oh, here we go. Yes, sir. Benny. Measurement, yes. Well, um, Measurement's going to be a very big topic today, actually. So um, I want to I, when I talk a little bit about the agenda, but that's a, that's a great one, and that, I sort of touched on it with the holistic video approach thing and that we might need a cross-platform currency, but measurement was a, we had a lot of conversation in our measurement breakout yesterday, and I don't think we had enough time to get to any conclusions. So we're going to have uh, a discussion about that today. So I'll talk about the, the agenda. Um, we've rejiggered it. We're going to start off... Adam Gerber from ABC is going to talk to us about um, the state of the marketplace from the content producer's perspective. And because he is so prolific, he's going to talk to us about possible ways of looking at cross-platform measurement. Where, where are the gaps? What, what gaps need to be filled? And where, what could be a future state that's going to get us to a more holistic marketplace? 
So he's going to do that for about an hour this morning, and then, um, then I'm going to come back up, and we will have a discussion. So Adam's discussion will be very much about measurement, and we're going to engage all of you in that conversation, and hopefully we're going to come to some real conclusions about an agreement about what makes the most sense to encourage a holistic and free flow marketplace. Um, I will then jump in and we'll talk, we'll, we'll take that a step further because in our, our measurement discussion, it wasn't just about, you know, how do we measure these things across platforms, but it was also about whether we need to put, you know, whether we need to layer on things like engagement into a, a currency for the, for the marketplace or um, viewability, um, which are very, seem to be very hot topics. So we're going to lead right into that. So morning is going to be all about measurement. Woohoo! Measurement. Then we'll uh, take a break, and Jesse will come up and do his thing uh, for Hulu, let us know what new content is being planned by Hulu and some of the strategies they are going to be employing going into the new front. And following Jesse will be Paul Santelli. He's going to start a discussion about content and the strategies and, and um, some of the questions that come up and, and came up in their content breakout session yesterday. And that, again, will be a group discussion. So there's going to be a lot of interactivity today. Um, so with that, I think I'm going to introduce Mr. Gerber, right? Am I, Josh, am I forgetting anything? Okay. Um, one more time before I bring him up. Anybody else want to say anything? Room 2108 have anything to say? Nothing. Okay, come on up, Adam. Am I on? Good. All right. So this is always the, the toughest spot at these two-day conferences. Day two, first thing in the morning, everyone's been out late. Um, so you're not going to have to listen to me pontificate for an hour. I know that Chris kind of suggested I was going to be up here talking for an hour. That's not going to happen. I'm going to try to set up some themes. And um, this is really more about everyone out in the audience thinking about some of these, these issues and trying to come up with, uh, with solutions that we can all agree to by the end of the hour. So um, with that said, before I get into the content, I want to understand kind of the audience, because a big part of talking about measurement and kind of how this evolves across the spectrum of video is, uh, at least for me, understanding where you all come from uh, from the industry. Are you ex-TV buyers who now sell digital? Are you still TV buyers who have never sold digital? Are you digital sellers who have never sold or planned television. So just raise your hands if you've got a TV background and you understand kind of how TV is measured, how it's bought and sold. About a third of the room, okay. What about digital? Who, who comes solely out of digital? You've never, you've never touched or planned or bought television in, in your careers? Okay. Who's never done either? <laughs> All right, that's good, that's good. All right, so we've got 60 minutes. I'm going to try to keep this as well-defined as possible. We're going to talk about the issue, its measurement. I'm going to throw out a couple solutions, how I see the marketplace. And for those of you who don't know me, I spent 15 years on the buy side. I spent six years at startups in the video space on the platform side and the data side. And I've spent the last three years of my career at Disney with ABC thinking about how content across platforms gets positioned and sold in the marketplace. So I've kind of done a little bit of everything. Then we're going to discuss. We're going to talk about how some of these solutions might evolve and hopefully come to consensus. This is what we all live and breathe every day. Measurement is a mess. Just from the conversation that we talked through yesterday in the breakout session um, to just general conversation I've heard in the room, uh, everyone is confused about quote-unquote measurement. It's lots of different things. We've got content that's flowing across all sorts of screens. It's being watched at different times. It's not just television in the living room anymore. It's everywhere. Video is everywhere. You even heard Barry yesterday talk about video in place-based environments. How do we solve for that? How do we measure that and incorporate it into the ecosystem and the marketplace and think about it and plan it and buy it and execute it on behalf of our clients. The big driving force around all this confusion is the fact 
that we've got lots of new technology that's powering different forms of distribution, different forms of viewership on different devices, and we've got this proliferation of data that's become available to all of us, whether you're the client, the seller, the buyer, all sorts of different data streams that allow you to evaluate the marketplace, to evaluate the effectiveness of advertising, um, and all of that is driving complication in terms of how we transact. There's another theme that I think is important to understand in terms of the challenge, and that's that at the end of the day, we all operate, whether you want to accept this or not, we operate in an established marketplace that is pretty big. It's 70, 80 billion dollars, depending on how you want to define the video marketplace in total, right? And marketplaces that are that big kind of have a couple requirements um, so that they operate. One is they have to operate efficiently. If they don't operate efficiently, if there aren't easy ways for commerce to happen, for the transaction to happen, the marketplace breaks down. Second thing is, for any marketplace to operate, there has to be a level of transparency between the buyer and the seller in terms of what they're actually transacting, how they're doing it, what data they're using, so that both can value and size the marketplace. You can't negotiate in the dark. If you're the buyer, you want to understand how big the marketplace is so you understand what types of pricing you want to offer. You need to understand the supply and demand constraints of the marketplace. If you're the seller, you want to understand that same dynamic, but you also want to understand what the buyer is actually trying to achieve, how they're valuing the product that you're offering into the marketplace. So there has to be a level of transparency so both sides can have a fair negotiation. And then at the end of the day, there has to be a basic unit of trade. There has to be a way for the marketplace to efficiently transact um, in a common denominator uh, type of, of environment so that that marketplace is easily understandable by both sides. At the end of the day, that's really all about liquidity. There has to be liquidity in the marketplace. So how do we get there? How do we, how do we go forward with a measurement approach for this increasingly complicated video environment um, so that all these other things that, that we know to be true um, actually get satisfied. So here's some truths from my perspective that, that I believe kind of set up this discussion. First and foremost, we, we kind of throw around the, the term measurement as if it's one thing. It's not one thing. There are lots of different reasons that people measure, um, and they measure different things depending on what those reasons are. You, you measure things on the front end of a marketplace to understand its size. You measure things during a campaign to understand effectiveness and to drive optimization. You measure things on a post-campaign basis to understand success. There are all sorts of different metrics that may flow into each of those buckets, um, but there are varying reasons that the different parts of the ecosystem are going to choose to measure things. The second thing that came up yesterday in a couple of the conversations is there's a big difference between how we transact and how we value. Um, I want, I, I've used an example. I'm not sure if folks in the room have heard me say this before. If you have, I apologize. So hopefully this will be new to everyone. I like to use the analogy of the stock market um, as, as a proxy for kind of how you should think about the challenge that we have and how you should think about what we're trying to accomplish here. If you think about the stock market, who, who here invests? Who, who kind of manages their own portfolio? Any day traders in the room? This guy right here. Um, but I'm assuming most people understand the basic dynamics of how the stock market works, right? You've got lots of companies that list their shares on an exchange. Um, and every company has a different float. They have different numbers of shares um, that, that are available for purchase. Um, and those shares are valued very differently by buyers and sellers in the marketplace. And depending on the company that you're talking about, you'll be using different metrics to evaluate how much you're willing to pay for that share of that particular stock. Some companies that are mature are valued on price-earnings ratios. They have predictable growth, they have predictable earnings, 
That's how they're valued. Other companies are valued on cash flow. How much cash are they generating? Other companies are valued on potential reward down the road, pre-revenue companies, um, valued on completely different metrics. Um, there are lots of different ways that buyers and sellers choose to judge the value of shares of companies. But at the end of the day, the stock market trades one thing. You trade shares in stock. So that's the unit of trade, shares. How they're valued on an individual company basis, completely independent, but you're trading shares. So that's how you transact. You transact shares. How you value can be driven by a whole host of proprietary measures or custom measures that an individual buyer or seller may choose to implement in that transaction. I want to throw out a semi-controversial thought here. I haven't raised this one before, so I'll judge kind of whether I'm ever going to use it again by the, how the room reacts. Um, thank you for waking everyone up, Chris. Um, the conversation that everyone seems to be having is about, we got to solve digital and we got to solve TV. I don't actually believe that that's the challenge that we have. Because fairly quickly, everything's going to be digital. And in fact, pretty much everything already is. We distribute our signal digitally. Increasingly, day by day, we have the ability to insert or address in certain portions of our video environments through the set-top box digitally. Um, this isn't about the digital or online world versus the TV world. I like to view it much more as this is about different types of content and the supply and demand constraints that exist within each of those types of content. There's long-form content. There's short-form content. There's actually also another tier of video inventory, which is not associated with content at all. It's just video ads that can be placed anywhere, on outdoor billboards, in banner ads on web pages. It's not integrated into a content experience, a video content experience. It's just kind of there, right? So that's really actually a third kind of type or form of content, video content. Each of those types of content have very different supply and demand constraints. Long form content is very supply constrained, especially in the traditional TV world. There's a fixed amount of units that run in linear shows. It's hard to manufacture more of that viewership. There's a, a pretty stable rate of viewership in the traditional TV space, defined a little bit more broadly now as live plus DVR playback plus VOD, and even online. But that short form content, think about how short form content exists on the web. You know, Yahoo, you heard from Andrew yesterday, um, they produce some fantastic content. But they also have the ability to scale promotion against that content and to drive viewership of that content up and down as needed. That Yahoo homepage is really valuable in terms of driving video traffic, if they need to drive video traffic. So there's a different supply and demand constraint in the world of short form content, nonlinear on the web. That's an important thing to understand. And it all plays into how we think about measurement and how these marketplaces evolve. That kind of leads me to this last thought, or the second to last thought, which is we really have multiple video marketplaces. I know that we all kind of want to think that it's one video marketplace, that on the buy side there's going to be this video investment group that manages everything, and that it's all done the same way, um, and that kind of that's how you go to market, and that's how you solve the problems for your clients. And even with our, within our sell side organization at ABC, and I'm sure this conversation happens at CBS and NBC and others as well, we're trying to figure out, all right, well, how do I structure? How do I go to market? Do I go to market as one and just kind of pound it into the marketplace and sell one thing? Or do I, do I have different components of what I'm taking out? Um, and, and should I treat my inventory in uh, or, or offer it in different marketplace environments? 
So let me get back to the thought of there are different types of measurement. Let's drill down a bit. Any questions yet? Nothing? I'm not boring the heck out of the room? This is valuable? All right, good. So let's talk a little bit about the measurement continuum and kind of all the different types of things that people are measuring um, so that we can focus in on what's really important here, because that's, that's the essence of this conversation, focusing in on what's the critical, important nugget and not allowing ourselves to get distracted. Think about the continuum. The first thing that's important when you're talking about measurement and the reason that people use measurement, both on the buy side and the sell side, is to understand how big the marketplace is. As a seller, I want to know, you know, we're about to go into the upfront season. One of the first things that the buy and the sell side does in, to prepare for the upfront is to estimate how many GRPs exist in the marketplace. Not just how many GRPs do I, ABC, have to sell, but how many GRPs are there in total across the entire marketplace? Because once I understand that, I'm going to understand how much share I should be getting of budgets and where I should be pricing my inventory. And the, sell, the buy side's doing the same thing. Buy side's trying to figure out how big is the marketplace so I can figure out where my leverage points are. I can figure out, do I think there's more demand in the market than there is supply, or do I think it's going to be a soft marketplace and pricing will be down? So understanding the size of the marketplace is really important. Second thing, once you understand the marketplace, is what the heck am I buying and selling? Is it audience? How am I defining that audience? Is it demographically based? Third thing, now you've bought the campaign. Did it run properly? If you're the advertiser or the agency, that's an important thing to understand. You want to know, all right, I bought this, I bought X. Did it run where it was supposed to? Then you want to know, well, was it actually effective? Now, that's a complicated one, and I'm not going to get into that, because that, I don't believe that that is necessarily the publisher's singular role to make sure that an advertiser's creative or their offer is effective. There's probably a joint risk that exists there, but to a big degree, whether or not advertising is effective has a lot to do with what the product offer is, was the creative strategy good, was the media well planned and placed? Price comes into it if you're looking at things on a cost per acquisition basis. Did I overpay for the media as the buyer and did that throw off the effectiveness of the, of the campaign? And then lastly, did it deliver the client's ultimate goal? Did it drive sales? Right, so there are lots of different things that you're trying to measure. Now, I am not going to focus on the value side of the continuum. Um, getting back to that first point I made earlier, there are ways that you transact and there are ways that you value. I want to focus in on how we transact, how we size the market, and how we buy and sell. Um, and I believe that for us to have an efficient marketplace and for us to have a measurement solution that works, there has to be transparency in that front end of the measurement continuum. Both sides of the marketplace have to be able to see the data and to understand the relationships between the data um, so that the marketplace can evolve. Quite honestly, on the, on the other side of that spectrum, I'm OK with things being opaque, even hidden. If, if a client or an agency has a proprietary way of evaluating the effectiveness of media, and they want to apply those measures or those metrics to, to the campaigns that they execute, more power to them. That's their differentiator. That's the value that they bring to their clients. And they should use those tools in any way, shape, or form to inform what they're willing to pay to a supplier for the inventory that they bring to market. I believe that in the long run, that's, that's good, because it will, it will reward the publishers and the sellers who have good content and good environments and who deliver good pricing and business models to those advertisers. And it will weed out the bad actors. It will weed out the content that doesn't, that doesn't actually deliver. Another thing, a whole host of things, words that I've heard over the last day, day and a half, V 
viewability, measuring viewability, measuring duration of ads, measuring the quality of the environment or the content, measuring engagement, verification, all really, really, really critical things and all things that help inform the value of the media or the price that you're willing to pay. I'm not going to talk about any of that. I don't want to talk about any of that because ultimately I want to focus in on where the measurement landscape is today. That was the veiled setup for Chris's follow-up conversation to, to my session. So let's dive into what we're really dealing with. So I asked the question at the beginning of the session, kind of who comes out of a TV background, who comes out of a digital background, and I asked that for a particular reason. I wanted to understand kind of how many of you were going to grasp this chart, um, whether it was too simple, too complicated. Hopefully it's right in the middle. Hopefully I've hit the sweet spot and this will help everyone understand kind of how the marketplace is evolving, kind of what the challenges are. So we don't live in a linear environment anymore where everyone watches at the same time. Network television today, depending on the show, in prime time, you can have as much as 40 or 50 percent of a show's audience watching on demand, watching on their own time, not watching live. Um, now it's not that rate for every show. There are certain genres that have a much higher live viewing uh, relationship than others. For example, reality. Reality tends to be watched live. Why? Because people like to talk about what happened. They want to watch it when it happens and talk about it the next morning. They want to engage in the social space in real time as things are happening. Sports, primarily watched live. News, primarily watched live. Scripted entertainment, dramas especially, watched on demand. Um, sitcoms to a slightly lesser extent. Um, so there's a, a radically changing environment in terms of how viewing occurs by genre. So you can't think of the marketplace singularly on day one. That's why you see across the x-axis kind of day one through 35. And down the y-axis, you've got kind of all the new ways, all the ways that people are watching, right? So they're watching live. <coughs> Most of us probably don't watch television live anymore. I, would, I spoke to a couple people, I asked them, hey, do you watch TV live anymore? And everyone who I talked to and asked said, no, I don't watch live. There's still a lot of people who watch live, but not everyone. A lot of people DVR, watch on a time-shifted basis. Some literally will start the program 15 minutes. Someone said to me this morning, I forget who it was. You know, sometime, Neil, it might have been you last night. My kids like to start the show 15 minutes after it starts so that we can skip the ads. Wasn't what I like to hear, but um, a lot of people do it. They literally use the DVR so that they can fast forward through the ads almost in real time. Watch same day. Um, and you've got a lot of viewership days one through three. Then you've got this growing phenomenon of VOD. VOD for years was kind of like the bastard child of on demand. Uh, no one kind of really knew how to use it. The navigation tools that the cable operators provided were terrible. Um, you know, it wasn't promoted well. The way that we got our content out to the cable companies was turkey jerky. It never kind of really got there on time. It, every system didn't post it the same way. That's been cleaned up. And to a large degree, video on demand is seeing very significant increases in consumption. People are understanding it better. Um, it's measured better now by Nielsen. Um, and uh, it's growing rapidly. Then you've got all the online platforms. You've got kind of going to a website on your desktop or your laptop, watching in a browser environment. Large number of the TV networks and Hulu and others have had tremendous success with their apps. They've distributed millions of apps, and large portions of their digital consumption are actually happening in app environments, not in the browser. And there's a huge amount, believe it or not, of consumption of especially long-form content going on through connected TV apps. 
So you've got kind of time on one axis, and you've got all these different ways that people are watching on the other. So let's, let's kind of get a sense of what can actually be measured and what can't. Well, I'm going to start with the easy stuff. Nielsen has this thing called the C3 rating. That's how the $70 billion of television gets transacted. Okay, and that's basically capturing all the viewership that's occurring days one through three in live programming and in time-shifted programming through the DVR. And now, I think I'm going to get this right. David will correct me if I get it wrong. All of the major networks have rolled VOD for the first three days into C3. Correct? Yes. So virtually all the on-demand consumption that's happening on the TV set, whether it's through DVR or through a VOD environment, is being captured by Nielsen in the C3 rating. And that's how traditional TV buyers are transacting against that viewership. This is what people commonly refer to as the bonus that advertisers get when they buy traditional TV. And increasingly, that quote unquote bonus is becoming a larger and larger portion of our inventory. So what happens to inventory in shows that are DVR'd that are watched on day four? Well, the consumer gets to watch the show. The ad was taped locally on the viewer's DVR box. So whatever ran in the live show was essentially taped and is played back. So all the ads that ran live are now being played back. Yes, you can argue some people skip them. A lot of people don't. More than 50% don't. Um, we don't get paid for those ads. They're not measured. They're not part of the C3 rating. They're quote unquote bonus. I don't think we'd characterize it as bonus, but that's how advertisers like to think of it. Um, that's a problem. It's a growing problem as more and more consumption moves out beyond day three. The VOD environment that I talked about so for the first three days, yes, it's rolled up into the C3 rating. But after that, it's kind of the wild, wild west. So up until about a month ago, there really wasn't any way to monetize that content effectively. There were kind of weird ways you could do it. We actually, what we were doing at ABC was, we would repitch all of our shows to the operators on day four, strip out all the ads that were running in the program that was pitched the first day and replace them with a lighter ad load and with different advertisers. Um, and we would let those ads run for the rest of the VOD window, which goes out through day 35. And we would sell them using rent track data, gross impressions. Um, a lot of buyers didn't buy into the approach. There wasn't a big market for it. It was kind of a little thing that we had in our toolkit that we took out to buyers. Worked for some advertisers, didn't work for most. Other networks were handling it differently. Some, some networks probably just let, didn't repitch their show and just let the same ads run. Again, bonus. A month ago, NBC announced that they were launching dynamic ad insertion. I think CBS hasn't made the same announcement. Um, we haven't announced the capability yet, but I'm sure it's coming soon. Um, but now we can dynamically ad serve, or networks can dynamically ad serve into a portion of their VOD inventory through Comcast um, and replace the ads like we do on the web with an ad server and deliver ads literally in real time based on pacing requirements or, or whatever kind of constraints you want to apply. So that marketplace is starting to change, and that's a good thing. Um, and I would guess that within the next 12 to 18 months, pretty much all of the VOD space will be enabled with dynamic ad insertion. Whether the measurement catches up to, to facilitate demographic buying is a big question mark. You can't do that today. Nielsen 
doesn't provide demographics for addressable inventory, and they don't have a way of measuring that. And then you've got all the digital environments. Kind of different, different solutions in each bucket, right? You've got, with online, that's kind of the most developed. You've got the ability to transact on a two plus basis. You can use demographic tools like uh, Nielsen's OCR, Comscore's VCE, or you can use any host of proprietary metrics. A publisher may have registration data that they use to drive um, measurement. A client, a programmatic platform, may have data streams that they use to target and measure what was actually delivered. But in the mobile app and connected TV environments, not as robust, no demographic measurement of those platforms yet, although Comscore and Nielsen are claiming they're gonna have a solution for apps within the next three or four months. That was a really complicated way of talking about what's happening. I actually wanna boil it down and kinda of make it a lot simpler. We really have two things that we're transacting. We're transacting units, and we're transacting impressions. Units are kind of the traditional television world of advertisements anchored in shows, uh, where the measurement is panel-driven uh, and where it's about the ad pod. The, the little you know, misunderstood fact about C3 ratings is they actually aren't commercial ratings specific to a commercial or a campaign. They're a measure of an average minute commercial um, pod rating. So they represent an average of the commercial pods, not sp anything specific to a particular advertiser's ad. That's very different from what we have in the impression-based world, where everything is measured at a census level, where you can get campaign measures, and where the inventory is really anchored to the user, not to the show. Um, think about it this way, in the on-demand world or in the impression-based world, um, every day is day one, right? So if Chris watched The Voice on Monday night live, actually this isn't a good example because I told you that reality isn't watched on a delayed basis. I'll stick with NBC but go with Blacklist. Imagine that uh, Chris watched Blacklist on Monday night live and I watched it Thursday night. Does it matter that I watched it four days later? No, I, I wanted to watch the show. To me, Thursday night was day one of, of that Blacklist episode. That was like when I'm watching it. Chris, Monday was the night he was watching it. So in the on-demand world, in the impression-based world, every day is day one. But ultimately, we're talking about audiences. So how do I see um, the marketplace evolving? Two ways. We're gonna end up with a unit-based world and an impression-based world. And today, two parts of those marketplaces are pretty well defined. Traditional TV, the unit-based world, digital video, on-demand video where dynamic insertion can take place, the impression-based world. But there are two kind of unknowns that still have to evolve. What's gonna happen in time-delayed viewership um, that can't be measured today? Does dynamic ad insertion move up into that environment and does the impression-based world kind of float up? And in the digital space, I know this is gonna be heresy, I brought it up in the, in the, uh, in the session yesterday, but does the unit-based world move down for the first three days into the digital economy? In other words, what would happen if the TV networks started running the same ad load and the same ads in all of their content that they put up online and in their apps and on connected TVs. So there wasn't dynamic insertion, you literally, the same exact commercial load, same exact commercials that ran live in television, ran online. Well, in about three months, there's gonna be a measurement solution that enables that. If Nielsen meets their, or six months, if Nielsen meets kind of the timeline that they've said, they're gonna have mobile C3 ratings available. And there's kind of the, a last component to this debate, which is, does the C window change, right? So today the, the marketplace kind of defines three days as kind of where we transact. Does it move to seven? Chris brought up a legitimate point earlier when we were going through this. Does it move back to one? And does everything after day one 
get treated in a dynamic marketplace, in the impression-based world? All good questions. But ultimately, it's about impressions. Units are just a way of packaging impressions. That's it. At the end of the day, you have sellers and buyers who need to transact on impressions. That's the unit of trade. They need to be able to price it. All the qualitative metrics, all of the underlying things that are kind of proprietary to one side or that are extra layers of data that you may want to evaluate a buy by, those are added layers that get built into the negotiation on a case by case basis and that drive how you value the media, how you drive, how you value the CPM, how you negotiate the CPM. I think at the most fundamental, I mean, I think this is one of the things the room's going to be asked to debate in about. The question is, when, when I list out impressions, am I talking about gross two plus impressions? Am I just talking about total impressions? Or am I talking about some kind of demographically constrained set of impressions? Um, I would argue that at the most basic level, it's total impressions, and that pricing, CPM, factors in the demographic or other kind of defined kind of parameters that you put around who the target is, right? I mean, in the TV world, we all argue about CPMs and, and kind of how CPMs are established. It's pretty straightforward. You start with a household CPM and you translate down through your demographic breaks, if you translate back up, at the end of the day, an advertiser's paying the same amount for the unit, right? It's all about how you choose to, to evaluate the cost. Do you want to put it through a lens of adults 18 to 49? Do you want to put it through a lens of women 18 to 34? Do you want to put it through a lens of total households? But at the end of the day, it all backs into the same cost per unit, right? So I would argue that at the most basic level, the currency should be total impressions, and that the way that you define the target and all the engagement metrics drive how you define the CPM. I don't know if you agree with that or not, but yes. So I've gone on for way too long. Now we're going to ask everyone in the room to talk. Um, the way we've kind of set this up is uh, two questions. And we'll probably spend about 10 minutes on each question. Um, what I'd ask is, and Josh, I assume we'll kind of mill around the room and kind of make sure that, and, and that the conversations are going well at each table. Each table, spend some time thinking about each of these questions. The first one is, you know, can these two video marketplaces coexist? This idea of a unit-based marketplace and a impression-based marketplace. Um, will they be managed by the same buy-sell teams? Will they be leveraged to achieve different goals? The unit-based marketplace may be used in a different way than the impression-based world, because there's so much more flexibility, potentially, in the impression-based world in terms of how you can place that media, how you can optimize it, how you can target it. And ultimately, over time, will they go closer together, or will they diverge? So that, that's kind of the first setup question. And uh, let's do 10 minutes on that. And then we're going to ask a couple of the tables who have prolific and really controversial findings to, to report back to us. Um, and then we'll go into question two. So uh, 10 minutes from, from now. It's going to require one person at each table to actually take control and make sure that you guys actually talk. Okay, so hopefully everyone's still talking about measurement. You're not talking about what happened last night. By the way, the pick for the tournament is Mercer. Pick for the tournament is Mercer. Okay, so who would like to, uh, to go first? Give us the feedback. You can be in complete violent disagreement 
with, with what we laid out, that's perfectly fine. The goal here is to see where the marketplace is, where the buyers and sellers are, where their heads are at. Um, Jeremy's got a mic. Who wants to offer up the first plate of meat for the room? Well, uh, we will then. I, I, I as the host, will start it off. Okay. Um, I will. I've just for the last eight minutes beat my table into submission. I'm going to say nothing that we talked about, only what I think. <laughs> no, interestingly, we actually ended up using our eight minutes debating whether or not um, there could be a, a marketplace that turns entirely programmatic. And there's some strong opinions uh, on both sides. Um, but that's not what we're, that's not the question. So the question is can two, Video, can two video marketplaces exist? And I assume what you mean by that is a linear marketplace and an on-demand marketplace. A, a unit-based yeah. marketplace and an impression-based well, marketplace. Why I'm, yeah, I'm call, uh, and the, so, um, yes, uh, we didn't get to discuss enough of this, but I do think that we're going to have uh, an ability to combine those two things, but the, the measurement of them will be slightly different, but they can be related. So in the, in the unit-based measure, we can have a commercial, an average commercial rating, and it can either be out to three days of DVR playback, or maybe one day it will be seven days of DVR playback, or, as I said earlier this morning, maybe if we can dynamically add insert into the DVR playback piece of it, we could lump that into the on-demand piece. The second, so it's linear and on-demand. And the on-demand can span your video on-demand, your cable video on-demand platform, your online on-demand platform, your connected TV, your mobile, uh, when we get that measurement to, to catch up. The idea would be that we would stitch together an agreement with an ABC that combines the linear commercial rating with an on-demand impression-based, uh, um, you can convert this, the TV, the linear, to impression-based, obviously, with an, on, with an on-demand piece that adds all those things together um, that would be either transacted on a total person's basis or on, on an age-sex basis. So the answer is yes, they can coexist. They can be sold by the same provider if that provider is playing in both of those worlds. But I would also say that there are many, many digital companies out there that we can also purchase in that on-demand fashion with, a, um, with a, a measured impression model that could have an age sex demographic applied to it. Or if a client was interested in going deeper or more granular than that, they could apply maybe a customer uh, composition to that as well. Seems pretty straightforward. Anyone disagree? No one disagrees. <clears throat> I'm not sure that I'm speaking for the table or not. <laughs> um, I think the thing that I'm struggling with is how do you have a unit marketplace for um, high quality, professionally produced digital content that's not related to a linear schedule or marketplace in any way? So a crackle. How do I, do I have a unit marketplace for that? I, I can't. Okay. L let me reframe, the, let me ask a question back to you about your question. Why would you want to have a unit-based marketplace in an environment where you can transact at an impression level? I don't. I don't. I was just, I, I think maybe I was then misunderstanding because I thought we're looking for is there a way to have a single marketplace that could be unit-based and, and I think the answer to that is no. Okay. Okay. Thank you. I'm clear. I think, I, think what, I think what Chris and I are trying to promote rather vigorously is um, that how, how the two different marketplaces are bought in terms of how the inventory is packaged is kind of irrelevant. At the end of the day, the most atomic level of what we all care about from the standpoint of sizing the marketplace and trading is the impression. That's the most granular level of audience exposure that you can count, right? 
the individual impression. You can, you can take a TV rating and convert it down to impressions. So if you can get to the lowest common denominator across the entire marketplace, why not use that as, as the base way of transacting across both segments? I think that's what we're saying. You'll use different measurement tools. You'll use the best-in-class measurement tools in those silos to measure the audience metrics that you want to apply to how those things are packaged so that you can convert down to the impression level. You know, today we use OCR. Some people use VCE in the online space. We use Nielsen in the TV space. We, use, we can combine those. What Chris said about being able to transact with ABC on a singular level, we do that today with ABC Unified. The other networks are doing it as well with Fluidity and you know, everyone's got a different name for it. All of us are doing it. So. But Adam, are, are, I guess one of the things we talked about is around that idea of impressions. So, but are the impressions, are impressions impressions is the question. And so you're, you're deriving impressions different ways, okay? And you're trying to get to the lowest common denominator of what an impression is. But I, I think the question is how do you normalize for value around those impressions? And you're tr trying to combine two different sets. So I, I think that's where the confusion comes in. Right, and that, that's, that's exactly the problem. We're, try, we're talking, we're confusing and mixing two different things into one conversation, in my view. There's how do you transact, what's the base level of the market? I argue that's the impression. What you're talking about is how you value the impression. And I think, I would argue that's what Chris is going to talk about in the next session. There are a whole host of ways. Look, we do it in television. We've done it in print. We've done it in every other medium. There are all sorts of other extended metrics that people apply to derive a CPM value to a particular bucket of inventory, right? In print, for those of you who have planned and bought print, you look at things like reader per copy, time spent with the magazine, average number of issues read by the audience. There are all sorts of metrics that you factor into. Am I willing to pay this publisher a $10 CPM or a $2 CPM? Whoever planned or bought Soap Opera Digest, what'd you pay for it? About $2, right? Okay. What do you pay for Architectural Digest? Why? And? and all sorts of other things, reader per copy, how valuable is, is the core audience. That's the same medium, right. though. It's print. Very different publications, right? Different ad formats. Soap Opera Digest was about this big. Architectural Digest is about this big. Right. OK? The ad format sizes were different. There are all sorts of things that come into play to how you value that ad unit or those impressions that you're buying. And I would argue that's what Chris is going to talk about later. I just want to focus on how is the marketplace transacting. Yes. Because I can't address impressions in a unit-based world. When someone buys a unit in Resurrection, they're getting everyone who's watching Resurrection, whether they want them or not. Okay? There's no way to isolate a particular segment of the people who are watching Resurrection and just deliver your ad to them in a unit-based world. In an impression-based world, there technically is. You can address down to the user level if you've got data and ad serving capabilities and target segmentation to drive that, and if the publisher is willing to transact on that basis. Right? So it's a very, you're still trading impressions, but how you can actually consummate the transaction is different. Table one. We're going to keep our answers painfully simple. Uh, can two marketplaces coexist? Yes. Um, whether it be the one-to-many model of the unit-based economy or the one-to-one -one model of the impression-based economy, ultimately, going back to the two-plus that you referenced, Adam, which I kind of like, um, it does come down to both of those going to deliver ultimate impressions, so that they can coexist if we want to talk about measurement and value down the road, the information's there. Um, will it be managed by the same buy-sell team? Uh, we think yes. Ultimately, there should be a focus on the ultimate goal or end-game strategy, and one team is probably best equipped to address that strategy. 
Will they be leveraged to achieve different goals? Yes and no. Um, what is the overall strategy of the client? Is a digital extension in more of a one-to-one -one going to be something that's focused on acquisition? Is it a reach extension? Is it a, a mixed play? I think we're going to give a yes-no answer on that. And then uh, finally, however, will they grow closer together or diverge? We think ultimately they will absolutely grow closer to together. Okay. I'm going to jump to the, unless anyone has a critically important comment to add. What? Okay. I, I just want to clarify one thing, which is that what we're talking about, I think, in this question is really, that we all recognize that there are different tools that can be used in digital, and Jess sort of uh, alluded to it. There are going to be times when somebody's digital budget is, and many times, when somebody's digital objectives are very KPI focused. And when you go out to do business, whether you're in the video space or the display space, your metric, your currency is probably going to be an action of some sort. It's not going to be an impression. You might buy some impressions because you're trying to deliver the action, but your measurement, your scorecard, your, your evaluation of whether the campaign was a success will be KPI driven. That is one marketplace. When we talk about crossing between TV and digital in the video space, and we're talking about can there be, um, can these two things be combined into a fluid market and sold and bought on the same metric, it is very much about using digital in a different way. It's about using digital as an extension of bu you're buying audiences, basically. The goal is to buy an audience. That audience should start with a basis of the total audience reached by the TV network or the digital provider or the guy who's selling both. And then what we're, I think we're saying is you can, the, that's the basic and what we're looking for is some agreement among the industry that there is a, a way to buy across screens based on one currency that might, be, that might be measured by OCR and might be measured by Nielsen TV ratings, but the impression is the common linking factor. Then, if you happen to be um, a car manufacturer and you want to layer on a composition of people who are likely car buyers against that person's two plus total, great. That's your chosen demographic that you'd like to buy against across, in, both, in both areas. If you are a, uh, an advertiser who's looking for a little bit more mass and you want to reach adults 18 to 49, then that would be the layer you place onto it for your TV and your digital. The, the key is, can you buy with a similar metric in both spaces so that you can look at these things more fluidly and that maybe TV money might flow towards this on-demand space which is represented by full episode programming as well as great programming produced by web endemic companies like a Crackle or a Hulu or a Yahoo. Like the idea is we would not want to take away from, the, a web provider should offer opportunities for people to do one or the other. Hey, I'm willing to deal with you and, and I will do business on a KPI driven metric or if you want to buy more holistically across screens, can we agree that there's one way of, of doing business in that way? That's I think very much what Adam's trying to get everybody to coalesce around. Yes. Sorry. I said it I in a much more complicated way, but thank you for simplifying. So, yeah. so an ad network would be able to do, if you, the ad network would have to understand the goal, right? Your goal might, if your goal was KPI focused, the question was how does that apply to an ad network type model, right? Somebody who's aggregating audience across thousands of partners maybe. Um, that ad network company should be able to play the same game as a content producing company. So they should be able to sell on impressions that are lay, uh, against which a demographic or customer target would be overlaid and the price paid changes based on that, right? If you, if you choose to buy on total persons because that's what you want to reach, your CPM will be low. If you choose to a sub-segment of those total people that might represent 30% of that audience, then your CPM arguably should triple, right? Or, be, or because there's a competitive marketplace, maybe it only doubles. But the point is the price paid is based on the layer of targeting you're applying to the total impressions, okay? Yeah, it's a separate line item. Are you, do you envision that as a separate line item? 
the, the transaction should be on whatever it is you're trying to buy, whoever you're trying to buy. So you're not going to do a person's two plus and an adult 18 to 49 CPM. You're going to choose one or, one or the other. And then the other thing the DSP should offer is if somebody's just looking to find in-market car buyers, and if they want to buy those, that, that's fine too. That's going to be it. Or they're buying actions. They're buying conversions. They're buying bookings for a travel company. So KPI-driven or audience-driven, I think all we're trying to say is that TV and digital can be looked at holistically and there should be a common currency between them. In the, in the aggregate, doesn't this normalize around uh, GRPs for intended targeted audience? Yes. Yeah, and I just think that the, we're saying impressions. Impressions can be converted to GRPs if you want to, which I, I like to stay away from the GRP because it's a lightning rod. So question number two, we were going to do it as separate tables, but we're, for, for expediency's sake, we're just going to open it up for group discussion. Um, I may have jumped the gun by starting this by saying if it's so simple, because we've had so much debate. But if you think of it just in terms of impressions being the base for the marketplace, if it is so simple, what's holding us back, and how do we overcome the barrier? So I, I'm throwing out kind of three potentials that are holding us back. Is it a lack of tools and standards. That seems to be where most people gravitate. Um, is it a divergence in the TV and digital cultures? So what I mean by that is, look, if you come out of the TV buying or selling space, you've lived in a world where there's fairly balanced supply and demand economics of the marketplace, and it's been that way for years. Right? So you're used to negotiating to a fair compromise. That's not how, look, I used to be a digital buyer. That's not how digital buyers have grown up. They've been used to having a hammer in their hand because there's so much supply in the digital space. They, they control all the leverage. So if you come out of a digital buying culture, You've got a very different point of view in terms of how you approach a negotiation than if you come out of the TV world. That's created a lot of conflict, right? As, as agencies and as sellers have tried to combine the silos, that's created a lot of conflict. So is that the issue? Or is it structural problems? Is it the fact that clients put their TV money at one agency and their digital money at another? And some clients don't. They put them in the same place. And some sellers sell separately and some sellers don't and there's no consistency in the marketplace and there's all this structural confusion that there's no way to drive forward in a common way or are there other are there other issues that are holding us back so anyone want to to respond to any of that throw out a point of view what's what's the biggest challenge what's the biggest thing that's holding us back in the back of the room there Can you, hold on, can we wait for a mic to get over to you so everyone can hear? I get it on the digital side for wanting to buy, you know, impression-based, but for the networks, if you have a big primetime show and a brand wants to buy women 18 to 49 impressions and they buy them all, the issue for the sellers is finding who buys those other impressions and does it get devalued and are you better off just selling one unit and getting and maxing out the rate? So you're, you're suggesting that in the, in the unit-based world, well, in the unit-based world, of a show. Yeah, it, you'd probably rather sell the units if you start chopping it up, or you're going to get less money. You're talking about the whole. lift versus drag um, question that a lot of sellers are thinking about, which is if I all of a sudden break up these units into impressions and allow buyers to cherry pick the impressions they want, either the users or to apply frequency caps or to do all sorts of things, that you're going to end up with this pile of impressions that no one puts a value against. Huge issue for the sell side. And by the way, for that model to ever work, the premiums that would have to be paid for the cherry-picked impressions probably would be untenable for the advertising community to digest, even though the value of those people probably equates to the premium that the publishers would be looking to achieve. At the end of the day, it costs money to produce content. So whatever ad model evolves, 
can't reduce the amount of revenue for the content companies because then they won't produce content, right? So the change in the ad model has to be net neutral, in my view, or positive as a win for both sides. And um, you'd have to have advertisers willing to pay an extremely large premium for the cherry-picked impressions so that it made up for any loss that they would take on the impressions that advertisers didn't value as much. Do you agree or disagree? You're looking at me like I have three heads. No. No, what I'm saying is that, so think about it in terms of, um, I'll talk about it in terms of digital. We have a lot of folks coming to us saying, we want to put a frequency cap. We launched ABC Unified that has parity pricing across our television prime time and our digital prime time inventory, right? Pay the same CPM. But now we've got folks coming to us and saying, I want to put a frequency cap on your digital. I only want to take one impression a week or two impressions a week against a user. Well, that throws off the whole balance of what you've agreed to buy, right? Because now all of a sudden you're saying in the digital environment, I want to cherry pick the users and I don't want to accept additional frequency from people who are repeat viewers. Well, you, that's what you're buying in television. So if there's parity pricing and we're, we're moving it as one marketplace, the terms are the same on both sides, right? If you start implementing a frequency cap on the digital side, you're going to need to pay more for those users. But that's a frequency cap argument. You could apply anything. It could be a frequency cap. It could be a data-driven overlay. It could be, you know, all sorts of things that someone wa might want to implement in the digital side, and it plays out in the TV side as well as addressability evolves. Exactly. or want a BMW and I only want to reach them once a week, right. which reduces my supply yeah. as a seller. I think that those, those, are, those are negotiated terms that, that can happen in a fluid market. Right. There are supposedly two other comments, so, yep. I just wanted to address a few things that the, the table came up with that I thought were, were interesting. So, since I started in the business, I was always told as a digital guy, you know, this is all about GRPs. You better understand what that means. It's all going to be that way. Everything you do is going to be GRP. And all these years later, you know, we're sitting here talking about this, and I just think that's going backwards. It has to be about an impression for all the reasons you're saying. Um, a lot of the, uh, the panel, uh, the group here agrees that taking panels and projecting households doesn't work. Getting down an impression level works. It's not, uh, the TV way of buying is not as sophisticated as digital. Um, the, look at the programmatic world, you can buy on an impression level, not on a thousand impression, on per impression level, using all the best data and, and doing it on a bidding system that works. And how big works. is that marketplace? It's getting much bigger uh, every year. It's growing, I think, 30% a year. TV marketplace is over here, right. this big. It's shifting. Programmatic is here. You, you have to factor in the reality of the marketplaces. Sure, I agree with sure. what you're saying, but you have to factor in the scale of the marketplace. So, so you say, what's holding us back? I mean, I think the, the group here agrees it's, it's the technology. It's a technology from the cable companies. I mean, no one's really talked about this, but right, like Time Warner or Cablevision, if they want to change their, their box tomorrow to do this, I, I would buy it. I, 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 would, I, would, I would get involved. And they do allow this for some of their screens, not in the actual uh, content, but you know, as you're browsing, there's a lot of things that are addressable and that are based on an impression. So they're getting better. Um, but there, there really is a lack of education. I mean, TV folks should be able to understand digital enough to sell online video and vice versa in some respects. Um, because when you go in a room with a client and then there's 
a salesperson from TV and a salesperson from digital, it just tells everyone in the room this is different stuff, different CPMs, different thinking. So that has to change. That's that's not changing fast. So I think you're alluding. So I think you're saying you're agreeing that structural is a problem. Yeah. The, the structure, how the teams, the teams are talk. structured yeah. and how they go to market is a problem. And same thing with the agency side. So I'm not just you know looking at this from the sales teams that really are really structured, but the agency is the same way. Uh, working on the agency, I see silos. We're trying to work together, but not enough like we need to, especially with the education. There's no education, especially for the digital folks on TV. Uh, I feel like the, the TV folks are getting a lot of education on digital, but not enough going the other way and really understanding it. And then, um, so those are the main points of what's holding us back that I think really do have an impact. And a lot of it is just taking time. Um, there is no silver bullet. It's that education and that coming together uh, that's gonna build this new culture of what can we do together versus you're taking my money, leave me alone. You're taking no, my I, money. I think those are all great points. I, I think the, the fact that people have to talk to each other and start figuring this stuff out as opposed to trying to battle each other and take share from each other, it's, it's more about collaboration and figuring it out and together. And everyone looks better together, yep. right? The, the publishers look great because they're coming up with great ideas. The agencies look great because look, we're, we're leveraging everything to create more value and the clients have to you know, see that and be happy about that. So. Okay. Was there another? No, that was just a Hi. I, I think that um, as someone who's been in the marketplace trying to sell a census-based currency for the last several years, and who is measuring not three days, but 35 days uh, on, a, on various platforms, I, I feel that uh, things are changing and that there's a lot more openness to trying to look at measurement in a different way than we have in the past and to and to separate, like you said, maybe the pre and the post and looking at it different ways in order to value. But what I do think is, it, somebody said it over here, this time is what it's gonna take. We've, we've measured things the same way and looked at things the same way for 60 years. And we have, at the same time that we have a lot of new ways that people are consuming video, we're also trying to change the way agencies talk to networks, buyers and sellers are exchanging um, both transactions and, and value. And I think that um, probably all those things that you wrote there are, are pretty accurate. <coughs> Knowing from, from us, just getting into the buying systems with a different kind of currency has been really challenging for us. And those doors are slowly opening, and we're starting to get into those systems to make it easier for a buyer to be able to look at one tool that they buy from and see different metrics mm -hmm. that they can evaluate and determine the best buy on behalf of their client. So that tools and standards, I think, is a big one. And then um, I do think, just sitting in this room the last couple of days, I've learned a lot, and I, um, I come at everything from a TV base and I listen, sometimes I'm shocked by what I hear others in the room and the way that they think about things that really opens up that dialogue between both TV backgrounds and, um, and digital backgrounds. So I think that, that meetings like this can start to change some of that. And then I think there's a lot of inertia, um, unfortunately. I think that it's the way it's been done forever and you can have the best idea in the whole world about how to do it differently, but it's really, change requires a lot of um, input and a lot of people and a lot of time in order to make it happen. So uh, I appreciate the idea and um, I think that meetings like this where you have the opportunity to express those and then try to figure out how to make them happen are important. So thank you for Great. what you said today. Thank you. Yep. Uh, I'm gonna have time for one last. One last question, anyone have, okay. Just I have one comment on, on, and one of the things Kathy said, and I, I, I think it's great, you know, we're taking on this conversation. It just strikes me that, um, you know, who's the governing body on, you know, on this? That, I mean, that, that seems like a pretty simple question. And, I, you know, we've had a couple of conversations about it. And, you know, is it the IAB? Is it, I, I mean, who, who's gonna take it on? Because obviously we've had great discussion. We've made great points. I think, you know, the way you laid out the measurement system is, is terrific. But uh, ultimate, ultimately, how do we kind of bring it all together and, and, 
you know, move it in the right direction? Who, who's the governing body? There, I don't think there's one entity that, that can govern it um, because you're talking about different platforms and different business models. There is a group that, I, that I'm not actively involved with but that I'm aware of. Other people in the room may be, may be the folks from Rentrack are involved, maybe David from CBS is involved in the 3MS initiative, which is making measurement make sense. And they're focused on identifying a set of standards so that we can better develop cross-platform measurement tools and, and approaches for, for kind of planning and buying and executing um, in the cross-screen world. So I think, you know, I, I know they have a website. If you're interested in that stuff, go look at it. Understand what they're doing. The IAB is involved, the MRC is involved, I think the 4As and the ANA are involved. Um, everyone's got to talk about this together because it's no one particular entity's domain. It's everyone's domain. And as things change rapidly, we got to work together to figure it out. So I'm going to leave it there and hand off to Chris. And uh, hopefully we can dive deeper into the qualitative stuff and kind of all the, all the ways that we actually figure out what the CPM is. So let's give Adam a big hand. I have to say that's probably one of the most complete and um, I think uh, really well-rounded discussions I've ever been part of on this subject. And Adam, that was a great setup. Thanks a lot for that.